hi everyone um thank you for joining um this uh, i guess what we think is the first in a series of webinars we will start to run more regularly around um uh, focusing on private equity uh, in particular um so i'm joined by a couple of colleagues uh today uh, on this uh, webinar uh if we can move to the next slide jen please that'd be useful um um i think there might be a, a small delay in the slides moving apologies everybody but uh, yeah, I'm joined by two colleagues today, um, um, Elliot and Caspian. So I uh, uh, am Chet, as it says on, on the page there. I'm one of the partners at Beringa, and I effectively am part of the leadership team um, of the practice that focuses on investors. Um, so we, you know, we work all the way from uh, late stage VC, cover the widest range across the mid market, you know, including both growth equity funds and traditional mid-market uh, private equity funds uh, going on to large cap and infra investors as well. I think it's worth sort of saying that this particular webinar is uh, quite focused on the mid-market in particular. Uh, and what that means is, you know, we'll cover things that are relevant to, uh, I guess, growth equity investors, mid-market private equity, and other sorts of investors that are doing uh, private equity style investments in the mid-market which these days could be family offices, hedge funds, etc. So uh, it's a bit more targeted uh, today. Um, I'm joined by Elliot as well, um, uh, who is a, a director in our team and an expert in, in the sector. Uh, Elliot and I are out in the market speaking to various market participants. So we'll bring to life some of the things that we're hearing in the market. Uh, and then finally, Caspian as well, who is the lead economist at, uh, at Ringer. Uh, who will bring to life some of the macro themes that are shaping, uh, I guess, trends in the mid-market. Um, so why don't we get started? Um, we've got three sections we're going to go through. Um, my colleague Caspian will kick us off first for about 20 minutes talking about uh, macro themes uh, that are shaping kind of underlying trends in the mid-market. Um, between Elliot and myself, we then do the second uh, and third section, which is around you know sector performance in the mid market, what we've seen, more importantly, what we're hearing from our uh, conversations with mid market participants. And then finally, based on that, what are some of the themes uh, or trends that we've seen that are likely to persist in the medium to long term that uh, mid market participants can take advantage of. So let's kick off, uh, Caspian, uh, over to you to talk through the macro outlook. Thanks, Chad. So I think, um, as, as Chad says, I'm just going to spend 15 or 20 minutes highlighting the big the sort of macro landscape, which obviously is informing all of us, not just those in PE, but also corporates uh, as well. And I think really the story has to start with the two potential outcomes of, of the market and macro volatility that we're seeing. And really over the last six or nine months, the conversation or the commentary has been around two prevailing scenarios a so-called soft landing, which actually now is the consensus view of market actors, and then a more adverse downside scenario, a so-called hard landing. And just to remind everyone about why we're talking about that, obviously we are in, uh, in the midst of a rate tightening high cycle, central banks across uh, developed but also emerging markets raising rates considerably to a peak rate of about four to five percent in light of a significant inflationary shock arising from both COVID stimulus in North America in particular, but also in other markets in Europe and the Asia Pacific around the shock to wholesale gas markets. And actually, those two scenarios have very different implications when we're thinking about the next six to 12 months. When we think about a soft landing, then we're really talking about a relatively benign outcome where central banks are able to tighten rates sufficiently to bring inflation down, but without invoking the sort of material recession, a contraction in economic activity that would potentially dislocate corporate earnings growth and, of course, equity valuations. So our soft landing scenario, which I think is now the consensus view, is that growth uh, is achieved in 2023. We, we avoid a recession. Rates peak uh, at about four to five percent, depending on the geography, five percent of the US, closer to three and a half in the ECB, closer to 4.5 in the UK. And ultimately, that is successful in bringing inflation back to two percent at the end of the year. As a result of that, actually corporate earnings remain relatively robust and we've seen strong earnings estimates coming out for this year, about four to five percent of both the S&P, the DAX uh, and the FTSE. Uh, 
As a consequence, corporate valuations are appropriately priced, and that's really important. We obviously saw a sell-off in both public and equity and private markets at the end of last year. And if ultimately a soft landing is achieved this year, we don't see uh, ultimately any further falls to valuations in that soft landing scenario. However, clearly there is uh, and remains a risk of an alternative, more adverse scenario where for many reasons, and we'll touch on, on some of those, the banking crisis with SVB, over tightening risks from the Fed, softer employment data coming out of the Eurozone. We may ultimately fall ourselves back into the so-called hard landing where we do see a contraction in economic activity in 2023 as a response rates may start to fall again to provide stimulus both to markets and the real economy and the risk therefore may be that uh, inflation collapses not just achieving target but falls well below it and ultimately the earnings and forecast that we're seeing priced in public markets especially actually doesn't materialize we see a revenue recession with margins and revenue contraction and as a consequence uh, p values would fall corporate valuations would fall and so these are the two scenarios that we have been discussing over the last six to nine months. And ultimately, we've seen a big pendulum shift. If we were having this conversation in July and August, the market consensus was on the right hand side. This was the most anticipated recession on record. 80% of professional forecasters believed we would be in recession either in the fourth quarter of 2022 or the first half of 2023. The good news is that that clearly hasn't happened. Uh, and I think it's fair to say the pendulum has now shifted to the left hand side, where actually the consensus, the money now is that actually we will avoid a major major economic contraction uh, this year. However, risks remain clearly and live indicators continue to show some risk, especially as we move in now to the second half of 2023. So this is certainly not over, but it is fair to say that the outlook has brightened. And Jen, if we move on to the next slide, we can talk about why that outlook has brightened um, in the next few slides. On slide five if we can get there. So one of the one of the big pieces of positive news is actually inflation looks like it's peaked uh, in all these markets, both sides of the Atlantic, uh, peaking at about 9% in the United States, falling quite rapidly now, decelerating relatively fast. And I think you can also say that for the Eurozone. The UK has got a little bit of a bumpier uh, road to reduce inflation. Labour market challenges, visa arrangements are particularly acute in the United Kingdom. That may make it a special case. But when we're looking at sort of developed markets in general, I think it's fair to say that inflation has peaked and is now starting to decelerate. There are still risks, however, when you look at the United States in particular, the role of energy and food inflation remains very small. That's giving us signs that inflation has bled out into the service economy. And the, in the US in particular, the labor market remains far too hot to be compatible with the uh, Fed target of 2%. So potentially more rate tightening is needed, especially in the US, in order to bring inflation back fully to 2%. But nevertheless, a relatively good story in terms of what we've seen with headline rates of inflation falling on both sides of the Atlantic. That's giving us confidence that actually we can return to target potentially sooner than many had feared at the end of last year towards the end of this year and ultimately start to bring interest rates back off uh, their rising um, trajectory. If we move on to the next slide, we can see what that means in terms of base, base rates, hopefully. So you can see on the left where the current base rates are. And the real story here is we've pretty much achieved where the markets expect and the central banks expect terminal rates to peak. Um, the current base rate in the US, obviously 5%. Expectation now slightly altered because of the SVB, slightly bringing that down. It was 5.5% and expected terminal rate down to 5.3%. But actually, when you look at the ECB in the, uh, the UK, we're nearly there. And that's giving us a degree of confidence that the most of the pain in terms of rate tightenings are now over. The only caveat to that is there is 
a slight disconnect between the market view, which sees potential cuts on the horizon in 2023, and the view of central banks themselves, which see more of a holding pattern higher for longer in terms of interest rates. And you can see that on the right hand side. That's the view of central banks from their dot plot. Actually, no real cuts in 2023, whereas certain equity markets are still pricing uh, valuations in light of reduced uh, base rates, falling uh, base rates for the end of 2023 with cuts in the Q, Q3 and Q4. So a slight mismatch there, but generally the story is that actually most of the pain in terms of the interest rate environment is over, inflation is coming down, and ultimately that's consolidating the market view around a soft landing, which is on our next slide. Uh, ultimately, the consensus now is that we'll avoid a recession and most of those markets that we're looking at, strong growth, uh, Jen, on the next slide in terms of the US, um, or 1.7% in terms of GDP, the Eurozone about 0.7%, uh, and the only outlier uh, is the United Kingdom, which has some specific challenges, which I'm sure we can all attest to. A small GDP contraction of minus 0.1% is now the consensus. More importantly, when we look at the corporate earnings expectation in that those environment, actually, I think you could say this isn't just a soft landing, but actually showing relatively good, strong growth in terms of corporate earnings um, across those markets, particularly the US and the Eurozone. And I think that's ultimately the real risk here. Corporate earnings expected to grow by 4% in the US, 6% in the Eurozone. That's relatively strong and you're seeing valuations based on that uh, earnings estimate. Now that does create a risk, obviously, because as we said on the earlier slide, there are still risks of a hard landing. Uh, we're not totally out of the woods yet, and there are uh, increasing concerns that maybe the markets have gotten ahead of ourselves here and have banked a soft landing before we can definitively say that actually that has been achieved. So I think that sets us up uh, or for an optimistic outlook for 2023, but certainly not one without risk. And ultimately, that's what we uh, wanted to address on the next slide, which is the big question, the elephant in the room is, what does SVB and the uh, corresponding market and banking panic over the collapse of SVB mean potentially for this narrative? I think the big question is, are we seeing, or are we witnessing, are we in the midst of a banking crisis? Well, Look, ostensibly, when you when you look at the AUM of bank failures, total assets of banks in 2023 that have failed, you know, this is a significant and serious event. Um, there's no doubt it. The first Republican SVB collapse represents a major shock to the banking system. However, nevertheless, I think the consensus view remains that unlike in 2007, 2008, contagion risks, especially into tier one and tier two banks, actually remains very small. The asset has provisions or the credit worthiness of those banks actually weren't called into question. Risk management challenges um, were, were clearly apparent both in First Republic and SVB, but this was a liquidity crisis rather than a solvency crisis, and that ultimately should give us some confidence when we look ahead into 2023. However, clearly there are risks um, to that, and, and ultimately that's what we want to explore maybe for the last five minutes. On the next slide, I think we can go back to our to our narrative about soft and hard landings um, and bring in a third option, which is to say we're, we're used to now talking about rate tightening cycles and the risks of a hard landing. Over the last eight rate tightening cycles, uh, three to four have revolt, resulted in a hard landing, a major economic contraction. However, actually, when we expand that commentary a little bit to a banking crisis, we can see that even in some instances where the Fed is able to achieve a soft landing, tighten rates, reduce demand sufficiently to reduce inflation in the economy, but not enough to invoke a hard landing or a so-called recession. We have had instances where there are a banking crisis. This narrative that the Fed or central banks tighten until something breaks. We've been focused on the real economy breaking for the last six or nine months. But maybe we need to widen our view slightly and incorporate actually what about if something breaks in the markets, particularly in the banking system. We saw that in, 19, in the late 1980s where the Fed was able to tighten by 3.8% on its base rate, achieve a soft landing. There was no recorded recession. But there was a number of financial institutions that collapsed, 977 consolidations in that time period. 
We also saw something similar in the 2018-2019 period. Fed's base rate was trying to normalize their rate environment. There was a coordinated action across all four major central banks. But actually, there had to be a pause in that rate tightening cycle as a number of things in markets were breaking, particularly significant outflows from bank loan funds. The Fed paused at that moment. We didn't know what would have happened because COVID then hit the second year. But there was suggestions that actually you saw some fragility in the banking system there. So actually what we're talking about here is not just a binary hard or soft landing, but potentially a third option where we do achieve a soft landing in the real economy, but the banking system as a whole remains very um, distressed and credit conditions ultimately tighten as a result. And I think it's therefore worth exploring that third scenario, Jen, on the next slide and ultimately what that means for PE. I, I, I'm speaking ahead of the slides clearly, but when it will it will come. So when we're thinking about a, a, this new scenario, this sort of third way, where we're able to achieve a soft landing, but actually there is distress in the banking system, whilst not major contagion that overspills into the real economy, financial markets do uh, remain distressed for a prolonged period of time. What would that look like? Well, we would avoid a recession, so the real economy would actually show growth, probably not uh, as strong as it would in the soft landing. Rates may peak later, the Fed may pause, and we saw that, right? Markets were originally pricing a 0.5% increase on the Fed base rate a month ago. The ultimate rate rise was just 0.25%. That will means that it will take longer for central banks to ultimately hit their target rate. And as a consequence, we may see higher for longer levels of inflation. The impact of that on corporate earnings would probably be slightly negative. Margin contraction we've seen with higher labor and energy costs continuing to squeeze corporate earnings and higher debt servicing costs, ultimately, uh, as a result. As a result of that, we'd probably see a uh, repricing of corporate valuations as those earning estimates underperform expectations. And so we could probably see both in public and private markets some kind of repricing action. So in that third scenario, actually, whilst the consensus remains on the first scenario, a soft landing, which is at this point a relatively benign outlook, I think it does now uh, remain pertinent to consider the third scenario. The second scenario, a hard landing, remains actually a receding risk. We don't think the probability of that is shrinking as the days go by. But that third scenario, a third way, if you like, between achieving a soft landing in the real economy, but having a prolonged period of tight credit conditions in financial markets is certainly a risk in light of the uh, failure of SVB and other financial institutions in the US. Ultimately, what does that mean in terms of private equity? The last two slides for me before I pass to Elliot. Um, Jen, on the next slide, we'll look at earnings and valuations. Here you're seeing uh, our earnings outlook for the S&P 500 uh, in green for 2023 and the uh, results in blue for 2022. In pink, you've got our hard landing scenario, which is Beringer's analysis on the market consensus, the broker consensus that we've received. And in yellow, our soft landing, but with tighter credit conditions scenario. That's looking at the debt leverage levels across these sectors, trying to extrapolate what the debt servicing cost would be in a higher rate environment. So in that tighter credit condition scenario, in the yellow dot there, we expect through economic history, rates to be about one to two percent higher, equivalent to a 1% or 2% rise on the, uh, the base rate because of the cooling of credit conditions in light of financial and banking market distress. So what does this show in general? Well, actually, in our soft landing view in green, actually, most sectors are now showing earnings growth, which has got to be a good thing, uh, both for valuations and revenue estimates. The big recoveries uh, are notably coming from things like consumer discretionary, which saw significant contraction in 2023 and a slight uptick in financials as those debt repairment rates, uh, debt repairment provisions that were taken in 2022 were ultimately paid back. And of course, there's some benefit to a, a, a steeper incline in the yield curve. The energy sector is, of course, the big loser, but actually that comes from an extraordinarily high base in 2022, earnings up in that segment by 150% on 2021. So actually, in our soft landing scenario for earnings, we see a relatively benign set of conditions. But of course, when we look at our other two scenarios, those yellow, 
yellow dots there where credit conditions are tighter, where margins are squeezed because of a higher for longer inflation pattern, we see a little bit more of a nuanced picture. Consumer discretionary uh, not doing so well, not rebounding to growth in 2023, while staples continuing to show some resilience, healthcare continuing to be an inflation outperformer, as you would expect. The high debt and leverage exposure in real estate also brings earnings estimates down for that segment in real estate and financials, of course, uh, falling because of that banking crisis. Our hard landing scenario where we see a real economy contraction is obviously materially worse, especially for the consumer facing orientated uh, uh, segments of the economy, staples, consumer discretionary technology falling considerably. So actually, whilst there is a consensus view emerging to those green bars, a relatively benign earning environment, there are still downside scenarios which are worth uh, considering, especially in light of, as we say, those distress in financial and banking uh, markets in recent weeks. Last slide for me then, what would be the impact, the second impact for private equity? Well, actually, one of the big stories for private equity, of course, of this rising yield environment is a return to positive real yields in safer asset classes. Um, we've seen that booming performance in equities over the last 10 or 15 years start to come off the boil. And you can see in this graph uh, nominal uh, yields by asset class relative to their 25 year history. So the green is our soft landing. That's what markets are currently pricing in. Pink is our hard landing and yellow is our soft landing, but with banking crisis. And I think the real story here is what's changed over the last year. We've seen equities start to underperform relative to the last 15 years. But when we're looking at debt in particular, you're starting to see a re-correction with yields returning to much, much more positive territory. Even investment grade credit currently achieve, achieving about a 5% uh, yield, um, completely uh, much, much higher from where it was just 12, 24 months ago, where that was closer to 2, 2.5%. So with increasing yields on safer asset classes, the consequence of that, of course, uh, for the risk reward profile of private equity is potentially quite adverse. The challenges of financing, uh, raising finance uh, and raising debt with leverage uh, buyouts in that scenario becomes much more expensive. And so the ultimate story here is, do we see a continued trend towards uh, returns to real yields in safer public markets? And ultimately, what are the implications for raising finance in private markets in light of that much more um, positive uh, risk, re risk return profile in public markets. So a few th questions, thoughts, I'll now pass back over to the team if there are any questions immediately or we'll push on. Thanks very much. Safe to say uh, between the slides taking a while to, re uh, to appear and what I'm being told appears to be a malfunctioning green screen behind me. Uh, Please do bear with us. Uh, these technical challenges will be sorted out next time, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, like like um, Caspian said, if there are any questions, please do post them in the chat and towards the end or or as appropriate, I'll keep an eye on the chat and, and bring them up uh, uh, and ask the question of the participants. Right, so I think we can perhaps start to move on um, in, in the interest of time. And um, let me just reset. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the mid market. Um, I'll make a start and then uh, my colleague Elliot will jump in as, as appropriate as well. So um, if we went to the first slide, which, you know, given the time delay that is going to the US and coming back will take some time, but it's appeared. Interesting. Um, what we're seeing, well, clearly, I think, you know, hopefully you will agree that uh, deal volume was sort of steady pre pandemic. Uh, obviously dipped massively in 2020 uh, as expected, but then 2021, I mean, you know, I mean, who hasn't read the headline that it was a record year for deal making, right? But why was it a record year? Well, I mean, there was a number of reasons, clearly. The easing of restrictions resulted in the great reopening in summer 2021, you know, government grants, funds, schemes ensured that people had disposable income, you know, owing to 2020 restrictions, disposable income increase resulting in an appetite to spend when restrictions eased and therefore benefiting businesses that uh, uh, private equity invests in. Now, focusing on, uh, you know, I guess P in general, but clearly mid market as well, you know, dry powder that could not be deployed during 2020 was being deployed in 2021 in, in large sums. Uh, obviously, there was a bit of a lull in 2020, so they had to do this. 
Now, a bit of a counterbalance there, you know, when there's a lot of money kind of flooding the market, you know, valuations were at an all time high for businesses in 2021, uh, particularly those that had grown quite favorably during the during the pandemic. Uh, and so there was lots of market chatter as we were out and about, Elliot and myself, speaking to private equity funds that, gosh, these these valuation multiples seem really unsustainable. Um, but investment was still taking place, clearly. Um, there was also a brief moment, uh, which some of you might recall, when the market felt that an increase in uh, capital gains tax was on the horizon. Uh, and this meant, you know, given market conditions, this was the best time to sell. But I mean, let's be honest, guys, we're all, we're all kind of, you know, at, at least in the advisor community, that particular uh, statement is often used to kind of stimulate market demand. Uh, and I've seen it come up a few times uh, and I, we will see it come up again, I'm sure. Uh, uh, so, so there was that point. Um, now, 2022 would have or certainly seemed to be following uh, a similar trajectory. It would have been an equally robust year. But then, of course, there was the invasion of Ukraine, which resulted in the cost of living crisis, uh, which stemmed from rising energy costs and so on. Um, interest rates were hiked clearly mid-2022. Uh, and, and what that led to was conditions where funding for leveraged transactions became really difficult, specifically raising money in the debt markets. You know, debt markets, well, for, for certain things were completely shut. Uh, but where they were open, they were no longer cheap like they used to be. And deal makers kind of found it quite difficult, therefore, to match some of the valuation expectations of uh, sellers. <clears throat> so all this kind of resulted in this hyper volatility as well in the public markets, making IPOs quite difficult as an exit strategy for the year, as evidenced by the data. I mean, there were literally I mean, close to zero IPO exits by UK mid market in 2022. What did increase, though, <clears throat> excuse me, were trade uh, acquisitions as an exit route. Uh, and so what that did was that helped kind of preserve some of the valuation multiples uh, and help PE get strong ROIs on their investments, regardless of the wider kind of market conditions. So more importantly, what are we seeing in 2023? Look, there are a lot of headlines <clears throat> recently because frankly, that's what sells uh, papers. <clears throat> Deal making is falling off a cliff, et cetera, et cetera. However, you know, let's look at the data. And if we look at the data, we should probably ask ourselves, you know, are we simply returning to more normal levels of deal volume as seen pre-pandemic? Clearly, there are other factors at play here. And I can't really answer that question at the moment. Um, however, there seems to be a little bit of that at play, right? Debt markets clearly continue to remain difficult. Um, and, and what that means is there is a real focus on those funds, or certainly certain funds find themselves at an advantage, uh, and those are growth equity funds, where clearly um, you know, no debt is being raised, or funds that are able to just basically do deals with pure equity right now, thinking about swapping for debt later. Um, uh, those deals are still going ahead, and there are some funds that find themselves at an advantage there. From our poll of market participants, what we're hearing is we think the second half of 2023 will follow basically what happened last year. Look, it's quite difficult to say not really finding deal volume, not really being able to kind of transact in the market, you know, while you're effectively earning one to two percent on the money that has been raised. Um, it's that's a difficult story to take to your LPs. Uh, and therefore, with transaction values kind of trending downwards as sellers, you know, kind of are adjusting their price expectations. We think there is well, clearly there is a lot of uh, uh, private equity dry powder out there looking for a home and there is pressure on sponsors to deploy that. Uh, and so maybe there will be a little bit of a fall off in activity in the first half of this year, just while we see conditions kind of normalize. But we do see uh, a strong uptick predicted in certainly the second half of the year, especially as the seller buyer gap uh, is bridged as well. Let me hand over to Elliot now to cover a little bit more here. Uh, by all means, uh, keep posting questions uh, as you have them. Yeah, so if we move on to the next slide, if we start by looking at the types of transactions that we saw in 2022, uh, from a deal volume perspective, Boltons increased substantially. And that was, as we've talked about, uncertain market conditions in 2022 led to PE concentrating on maintaining and growing their portfolios, often inorganically. And also the large deal volumes in 2021 meant that they were very early in that growth journey, so we saw a big rise there. Uh, both Chet and Caspian have talked about debt financing, so therefore we also saw, buy saw buyouts continue to fall as well due to the rate rises and continued uncertainty in debt markets. <coughs> so how do we expect this to go in 2023? 
So we expect that debt driven buyouts will continue to be subdued and part of that will depend on which of those three scenarios occur. However, we are starting to see them come back a little bit more slowly and expect they will rise slightly throughout the rest of the year. We're seeing significant interest from strategics, so we're currently working with a number of strategics that are looking to take advantage of the current market conditions. And you know, historically, particularly in 2021, you know, PE has been able to get use of strategics as they're much faster. However, due to leverage and some other issues, actually what we're seeing is that now strategics might have the edge on some of those processes and the ability to take a little bit more time as part of that. And similarly, we expect that bolt-ons will continue to remain above average levels, and that's driven by similar drivers in 2022. I was going to say, Elliot, one of the reasons why we're seeing, I guess, uh, deals take a bit longer is because strategics are now involved, and clearly they take a little bit longer to complete the deals, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we're definitely seeing, compared to you know, the heyday of 2021 and early 2022, that processes are generally taking a little bit longer and often not slower to launch as well. Yep. Moving on to the sectors, so you know, business services, TMT, and financial services are the largest sector in terms of deal volumes. We did see a slight decrease in consumer, as you'd expect, in uh, 2022. And you know, depending on which of those three scenarios happen, we may either see that continue to be subdued or a slight rise as earnings profiles recover. You know, we're seeing funds really focus on companies that have exposure to. Uh, so B2B companies that have exposure to more resilient sectors, so we're working on quite a lot uh, with exposure to public sector, FS, healthcare and industrials. And we're also seeing a few sector trends, which we'll um, come on to shortly. Uh, so in specifically, we're going to talk through uh, energy transition, uh, technology and digitization, and then ESG as well. Uh, so if we can just move on to those slides, please. Perfect. All right, so I think um, let's start with the um, energy transition side of things. Um, you know, it's a slightly um, slightly overused um, uh, term, clearly, uh, but I think it it perfectly captures uh, what is going on in the energy market uh, in general. Look, there's no denying the this kind of the secular underlying trend. Uh, around um, the energy transition, you know, uh, as an example, you know, about there are about 50,000 EV chargers installed to date in the UK, uh, and the demand is more for something like 300,000. And this clearly is creating opportunities across the value chain for market participants. Now, I'd say that, you know, arguably infrastructure funds and corporates have long been investing in renewable assets. I mean, I would almost say that that aspect of the market is almost a bit mature now, uh, even though it does get clubbed under the energy transition, clearly. What we're going to talk about a little bit today is what mid-market is invested in. So let's move a little bit down the value chain to where mid-market invests, particularly, you know, businesses, um, uh, mainly tech and services businesses, in fact, that support the energy transition. That's probably a better way to classify the sort of uh, targets that we come across and the sort of funds that we work with. You know, there's been this widespread circling of targets, so to speak, for a long time. I mean, almost, you know, last two or three years I've been seeing this. Um, you know, frankly, there were better opportunities to invest in and, and better uh, returns to be had elsewhere. However, recently, more recently, probably over the last 18 months or so, um, we've seen increasing deal volume by the mid-market uh, and, to be quite honest, competing infrastructure plus funds who kind of play in that same space. Um, you know, as targets have become more investable for mid-market and, um, uh, I guess, uh, infra plus. Yeah, I think that's a, that's one of the drivers is those targets becoming more investable. And the others is that, you know, due to some of the trends that have outlined other sectors making those less attractive, private equity has been willing to invest in smaller companies as well. So the combination of you know, lack of other options as well as these businesses maturing has meant that we've seen a lot more focus in this sector. So if we talk through some of the themes that we've seen in, and been working on, so Chet mentioned EVs, EV charging continues to be something we're seeing significant interest in opportunity due to the scale of market growth. And that's anywhere from the manufacturing of uh, EV charge points through to installation, operation and maintenance services. Uh, generation continues to be a theme for private equity. So 
you know, and again, manufacturing of solar batteries and other generation assets, both from a B to C perspective. Just, just pause for a second there, sorry, uh, Elliot. I just noticed that. I think we just need to move on to the next slide, uh, Jen. Apologies. Uh, carry on, Elliot. Sorry to interrupt your chain. Yeah. Uh, uh, installers uh, for B to B and B to C, as well as, you know, broader provision of energy efficiency and strategic energy advice, particularly to B to B customers. And then if we look at the larger generation assets, you know, O and M continues to be a strong theme with a number of investable companies currently in the market. Going down, we're looking at also decarbonisation of heat will be a key challenge for the UK to meet net zero. So around, I think, just under 20% of carbon emissions are from heating. So we continue to see that as a theme, though the point at which that will become increasingly important and gain traction is a question that we often get asked by private equity. And you know, we've done a number of thought pieces in that area. Uh, technology to support the transition, so flexibility platforms, core technology for energy market participants, be those sort of billing platforms or network technology or SCADA. And then finally, broader service providers in the energy transition. And this is anywhere from, I guess, your more traditional service providers. So things like electrical, so ICPs, meter installers, end-to-end uh, -end civils and project management for all the construction that's needed is one area. And then at the other end, you know, more higher end service provision in terms of data service providers, so energy data, ESG data, and then professional services that are helping to advise in the transition as well. So those are some of the themes that we're seeing as quite investable uh, from an energy transition perspective. Thank you, Elliot. Um... Yeah, I think, you know, I think worth sort of saying that given Beringa's, I guess, um, Beringa's footprint in the energy sector and, and our brand, certainly in the energy sector, um, as that translates down from some of the work that we do in renewables with some of our colleagues that work with infrastructure funds, as that translates down the value chain to what private equity is investing in, we perhaps, you know, we, we, we obviously are presenting a view based on what we see in the market and a lot of what we are seeing at the moment is uh, energy transition related investments. That's not to say there are not other sectors that are doing uh, equally well, but this we do have quite a detailed view on this uh, on this bit. So let's move on to the next bit that we're seeing. Um, and the slides obviously will take a second to catch up. Uh, but yeah, so you know, look, there's no denying the the other sector that we're seeing a lot in is, I guess, broadly software, technology, digital, etc., whatever you want to call it. Um, you know. It's been a long, it's been a long developing trend. Clearly, digitization results in you know long-term benefits like efficiency and scalability. But I think what's become more acute recently is you know with the recent labor market challenges, supply chain disruptions, uh, and within you know inflation intensifying, there's this need to do more with less. And you know technology in all its forms will continue to be the key lever in those efforts, right? Even if economic conditions deteriorate, you can you can kind of use it in that manner. However, having said that, you know, not all software companies are same and market attention is typically skewed at the moment, certainly towards kind of high, high growth, high burn stocks. Um, from, a, from a thematic standpoint, we expect companies that demonstrate a balanced profile of strong growth and profitability to continue to receive this disproportionate, disproportionate attention in the near term kind of m and market. Now, if you look at the three indices that you're seeing or, you know, on screen here, Clearly, the growth equity index is, you know, I guess the most volatile with the, I guess, the mid market buyout index being probably the most, most stable, I'd say, um, you know, after, I guess, what can only be termed as a gravity defying decade, you know, not surprisingly in 2022, um, the revenue multiples across all three indices uh, reached five year lows, slumping to about six to seven X trailing revenue. Um, interestingly, though, the multiples uh, of all three indices converged last year for the first time since 2008, which is quite an interesting phenomenon. I don't know if you have anything to add here, uh, Elliot. Yeah, and I think one of the things we're seeing this year is that both investors and strategics are looking to place greater value on profitability today compared to what they were doing previously. And, you know, I think, you know, and the other point is that, you know, this period, particularly if, you know, the um, shallower of Caspian scenarios uh, comes to play means that this environment won't necessarily last forever. So if we think about what uh, 
mid-market private equity that corporates need to do to take advantage of this. There's probably three key things that we see. So the first is that they need to be quick. So, you know, people, tech players that have forged deals during previous macroeconomic conditions like this have generally got strong returns, assuming that they've targeted the right companies. So this actually should, this should be viewed as an opportunity to pick up some companies that would have been priced much more uh, substantially previously on attractive terms. The second is just continue to be on the lookout. So look for companies that are raising funds and proactively look at which of the particular sectors, and we'll come to that, where there might be strong opportunity. And the third is just to accelerate that diligence again, you know, particularly where we are now, speed is very crucial. So make sure that you have con conviction both at the macro level as well as the granular level. And that's, you know, for leaders across cost, revenue, talent, capability upskilling their position, as well as their ESG factors as well. Um, and I think other elements, particularly now, are around, uh, you know, revenue synergies and talent retention as well. And I guess, you know, from a sector perspective, there's a few areas that we're seeing you know, very strong macro trends are risk and safety. So EHS compliance, corporate risk mitigation, supply chain assurance and workforce development and training as one area. We've covered energy as a theme, but also industrial technology as well. So sensors, software automated, analytic platform, risk mitigation, and operational efficiency. And also uh, another defensive sector, which we mentioned earlier, is healthcare and life sciences and technology opportunities there. Yeah, thank you, Elliot. So let's move on to the, the third area. And I'm going to begin unfortunately, guys, by using another overused term in the market at the moment, ESG. However, very topical. Look, the growing focus on ESG, you know, environmental, social and governance by PE firms, it's becoming increasingly prevalent across all stages of the deal process, from deal sourcing to exit. Uh, private equity firms are integrating ESG considerations into their investment decisions at each stage of the deal making process from sourcing through to exit. So, you know, is this universal across the, the mid-market at the moment? No. However, um, the firms that we're working with, certainly the ones that are at the forefront of this, the way they're doing this, they're looking at it during deal sourcing. So they're increasingly considering ESG factors when identifying potential investment opportunities, um, uh, you know, non-compliant or difficult to comply assets screened at the sourcing stage. Uh, further, you know, they are kind of directly investing into firms that are enabling or advising on ESG practices to capitalize on the growing focus of ESG as part of wider uh, net zero strategies. Yeah, and one good example of this is we recently worked with a mid-market private equity fund to acquire a leading ESG consulting business. And we see that as an area with substantial uh, growth going forward, as well as some of those other broader businesses that have exposure to this thing. Correct. Um, so just carrying on, so you know, we started a deal sourcing. Let's go through the life cycle then. Due diligence. Um, during the DD process, you know, PE firms are conducting deeper analysis of companies, ESG practices, risks and opportunities. I mean, ESG DD is becoming more and more commonplace uh, uh, in terms of the types of DD that is uh, conducted. And, and the more sophisticated firms are almost thinking about how this can be integrated into the commercial DD process almost. Uh, as you know, it can often lead to risks that would, I guess, risks or opportunities that would either reduce or enhance um, uh, the, the, I guess, the value creation uh, from that particular portfolio company. And in terms of investment decisions as well, you know, they are integrating ESG considerations into their investment decisions alongside traditional financial metrics. Um, and finally, value creation, you know, Again, the more sophisticated firms are seeing ESG as a value creation lever, you know, uh, changes that are made by identifying, I guess, opportunities uh, in ESG uh, can lead to actually expansion of the multiple at exit. Um, now, in terms of key concerns for private equity firms, um, you know, they can vary, I guess, depending on the industry, region and specific investment strategy of the firm. However, you know, most issues that are front and center at the moment tend to be sort of regulation driven. Um, most value creation plans um, are focused on developing a strong ESG roadmap that helps to preserve valuations, particularly, you know, it's quite, quite kind of apt in current conditions when we are facing into, I guess, a recession. Um, so the things that we are seeing certainly in the market are, you know, people looking at climate change and environmental impact. 
they are increasingly focused on, uh, I guess, environmental impact of their portfolio companies, carbon emissions, energy use, waste management, water consumption, etc. Um, in the UK in particular, TCFD reporting has been made mandatory with further net zero and science-based target reporting to become mandatory in the near future. So this is driving a lot of activity in the, in the I guess, the wider private equity space, but certainly in the mid-market. Um, cybersecurity and data privacy, you know, firms are increasingly focused on uh, these risks as data breaches have a significant impact on a company's reputation and consequently the financial performance. Um, so I guess firms are now looking for targets that have robust data protection policies and practices uh, and, and where they don't exist and using that as a value creation lever um, um, to, to make sure that it, it kind of is addressed. And then finally, supply chain sustainability. Like there's honestly the number of acronyms. There's an alphabet soup of regulations in the EU and UK, and this is effectively, I guess, helping in some way um, supply chains globally to become more sustainable through accountability and disclosures. Um, and 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 that's kind of one of the other trends that we're seeing uh, in this market. In terms of uh, you know. Um, Overall, ESG as a theme, look, we see this, just to, just to kind of summarize that bit, we see this across all aspects of the deal-making uh, life cycle, all the way from actually choosing targets, but also then kind of conducting DD, you know, using it as a value creation lever, and then thinking about at the point of exit, what you want to do from a sell-side DD perspective. Um, I'll leave it there uh, in terms of ESG. That kind of, I guess, brings us to the end of our prepared content uh, as well. If there are any questions that we can answer, please do post them in the chat and, and we'll pick them up. Uh, I'll give it a few minutes for any questions to appear. Um, but if they don't, um, I guess worth sort of saying that this is the first in the series and, and apologies for some of the technical challenges, but you will see more of these webinars appear uh, over the next uh, uh, weeks and months. Right, well, I don't see any questions appear, but if there are any, please do feel free to drop them either via email or, uh, or any other medium, and we'd love to answer them. Um, and uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time, everybody. Bye-bye.